Good morning, everyone. Let me say what a pleasure and privilege it is for me to be addressing this conference and greetings from uh, England. Because I have the title Astronomer Royal, I've been asked, do I do the Queen's horoscopes? I have to say, I'm only an astronomer, not an astrologer. And scientists are rotten forecasters, almost as bad as economists. But I've nonetheless written a book with the rather pretentious title, On the Future. And my forecasts, though, will be rather tentative. But my theme is this. The Earth existed for 45 million centuries. But this century is special. It's the first when one species, ours, has the future in its hands. We're deep in the Anthropocene. We could irreversibly degrade the biosphere, we could trigger the transition from biological to electronic intelligences, or a misdirected technology could cause a catastrophic setback to civilization. But let me focus first on two things we can predict, even with a cloudy crystal ball. The world in 2050 will be more crowded and it will be warmer. 50 years ago, the world population was about three and a half billion. It's now about 7.8 billion. The growth has been mainly in Asia and in Africa. And this distorted map gives each country an area proportional to the population growth in the last 30 years. The number of births per year worldwide was going up fast, but it's now peaked. And it's actually now going down in most countries. Nonetheless, world population is predicted to rise to about 9 billion by the middle of a century. That's partly because most people in the developing world are young, they're yet to have children, and they live longer. And the age histogram in the developing world, like in West Africa on the left here, will become rather more like it is in Europe, with the old at least competing with the young. Despite doom-laden forecasts made back in the 1960s, food production has kept pace with rising population. Famines still occur, but they're due to conflict or maldistribution, not to overall scarcity. To feed 9 billion people by 2050, however, will require further improved agriculture, water conserving and using genetic modification of crops and maybe dietary innovations. For instance, converting insects, highly nutritious and rich in protein into palatable food and making artificial meat and not eating beef. But if we could do all that, then to quote Gandhi, there'd be enough for everyone's need, if not for everyone's greed. Predictions beyond 2050 are uncertain. It's not even clear whether the population will keep on going up or start falling again. Falling infant mortality, urbanization, and women's education trigger the demographic transition towards lower birth rates, which tends to bring population down. But there could be some countervailing cultural influences. And if, for instance, for cultural reasons, population in Africa stay large, then according to the United Nations, that continent's population could double again between 2050 and 2100 to 4 billion. And then Nigeria alone would have a bigger population than Europe and North America combined. And another thing, if humanity's collective impact on land use and climate pushes too hard, the resultant ecological shock could irreversibly impoverish our biosphere. Extinction rates are rising. We're destroying the book of life before we've read it. Biodiversity is crucial to human well-being. But for many environmentalists, preserving the richness of our biosphere has value in its own right, over and above its value to humans. And to quote the great Harvard ecologist E.O. Wilson, 
mass extinction is a sin that future generations will least forgive us for. So the world's getting more crowded. And as a second firm prediction, it'll gradually get warmer. The famous Keeling curve here, data gathered in Hawaii, shows how the concentration of carbon dioxide in the air is rising, mainly due to the burning of fossil fuels. The seasonal oscillations, incidentally, are because there's more vegetation in the northern and the southern hemisphere. So CO2 rises in the autumn in the northern hemisphere when the leaves fall off the trees. The fifth IPCC report presented a spread of projections of future temperature for different assumptions about the future rates of use of fossil fuel. It's still unclear how much the climate effect of CO2 alone, which can be calculated easily, are amplified by associated changes in water vapour, changes in cloud cover, etc. That's a further uncertainty, and that's indicated by the bars on the right of this uh, slide. However, despite the uncertainties, there's one message that most would agree on, and that's that under business as usual scenarios, we can't rule out later this century really catastrophic warming and tipping points triggering long-term trends like the melting of Greenland's ice cap. Democratic politicians won't prioritize issues where the benefits accrue mainly to distant parts of the world and decades into the future, unless there's public pressure, unless they know the public's behind them and they won't lose votes. That's why, incidentally, we should welcome the public demonstrations which have occurred in several European countries, the Extinction Rebellion and such like, especially when those who are protesting are young people, because they'll still be alive at the end of a century and we shouldn't discount their future as all too many are willing to do. But as to what to do about climate change, there is one win-win situation one win-win roadmap to a low-carbon future. It's this, that nations should all accelerate their research and development into all forms of low-carbon energy generation and into other technologies where we need parallel progress. For instance, storage, batteries, compressed air, hydrogen, flywheels, etc., and smart grids. We should do all this because the faster these clean technologies advance, the sooner will their prices fall. So they become affordable to, for instance, India, where they need more generating capacity, where the health of their poor is now jeopardized by smoky stoves burning wood or dung, and where there'll be pressure otherwise to build coal-fired power stations. We should enable them to jumpstart the clean energy just as they've jumpstarted to a uh, uh, mobile phones and never had landlines. And it would be hard to think of a more inspiring challenge for young engineers than to devise clean and economical energy systems for the world. So young scientists and engineers are going to be crucial in meeting these goals. We should be evangelists for new technology. Without it, the world can't provide food and sustainable energy for the expanded and more demanding population who we'll have by 2050. Indeed, many of us are anxious that technology is advancing so fast that we may not properly cope with it and that we'll have a bumpy ride through this century. So let me express some concerns. We're ever more dependent on elaborate networks, electric power grids, air traffic control, international finance, just-in-time delivery, globally dispersed manufacturing, and so forth. But unless these networks are all highly resilient, their manifest benefits could be outweighed by catastrophic breakdowns, real-world analogues of what happened in the financial system in 2008. Our cities will be paralyzed without electricity, supermarket shelves bare, within a few days, if supply chains were disrupted. And air travel, 
can now spread a pandemic globally within a few days, and social media can spread panic and rumour and psychic and economic contagion literally at the speed of light. Pandemics are at the forefront of our concerns today. Advances in microbiology, diagnostics, vaccines and other techniques offer prospects of containing these pandemics in future. So we must foster biotech. But the same research does have downsides. For instance, in 2012, two research groups, one in Wisconsin in the US, another in Holland, showed it was surprisingly easy to make the influenza virus, shown here, both more virulent and more transmissible. And to some, this was a scary portent of things to come. Now, the COVID-19 virus is more complicated than the flu virus, but we can't rule out scenarios where in future that can be engineered too. And the new CRISPR-Cas9 techniques for gene editing are hugely promising. But here again, these have downsides. They raise ethical concerns about, for instance, the recent Chinese experiments on human embryos. And there are also concerns about possible runaway consequences of, of gene drive, where you try to make a particular species sterile and change the ecology. So biotech needs to be regulated. But I'd worry that whatever regulations are imposed on prudential or ethical grounds, they can't be enforced worldwide any more than the drug laws can or the tax laws. Whatever can be done will be done by someone somewhere. And that's a nightmare. Because whereas an atomic bomb can't be built without large scale special purpose facilities, which can be monitored, biotech involves small scale dual use equipment. Indeed, biohacking is burgeoning even as a hobby and a competitive game. And Sadly, technical expertise doesn't guarantee balanced good sense. The global village will have its village idiots, but they in future will have global rage. And the rising empowerment of tech-savvy groups or even individuals, empowered by bio and cyber technology, will pose an intractable challenge to all governments and aggravate the tension between three things we all want, freedom, privacy and security. These concerns are fairly near term, within 10 or 15 years. But what about looking further ahead? On the bio front, you might expect two things. First, a better understanding of the combination of genes which determine key human characteristics. And secondly, the ability to synthesize genomes which match these features. The great physicist Freeman Dyson imagined a time when children will be able to design and create new organisms just as routinely as his generation played with chemistry sets. Well, if it did become possible to, as it were, play God on a kitchen table, our ecology and even our species may not long survive unscathed. So let's hope that stays science fiction. But what about Another transformative technology, robotics and artificial intelligence, AI. There have been exciting advances in generalized machine learning. DeepMind's AlphaGo Zero computer famously achieved world championship level in the games of Go and chess by beating this chap, the world Go champion. And it's learnt to play world-class Go in just a few hours. It was given just the rules and learned by playing against itself over and over again. The computer's processing speed allowed it to complete several games every second. Already, AI can cope better than humans with complex, fast-changing networks, traffic flows or electric grids. It could enable the Chinese to process all the information needed to one an efficient planned economy of a kind that Marx could only dream of. And in science, 
AI's capacity to explore zones of options could help us to discover recipes for better drugs or material that conducts electricity perfectly at room temperature. Of course, it's the speed of computers which allows them to succeed by brute force methods. And here we see how their speed has been uh, improving over the years. They learn by brute force methods by what's called reinforced learning on big training sets. But there are limitations. Learning about human behavior involves observing actual people in real homes or workplaces. And the machine would feel sensually deprived by the slowness of real life. Them watching us is like us, watch, us watching trees grow. And it's hard for them to accumulate enough information to give them common sense. That's one limitation. And another is that robots are still clumsier than a child in moving pieces on a real chessboard. They can't jump from tree to tree like a squirrel, though a Boston Dynamics robot shown here uh, can apparently do somersaults. And the Go playing computer used hundreds of kilowatts of power. But the brain of the human champion, who I showed you, Loqui, he uses only 30 watts, a light bulb. And he can do many other things apart from just playing Go. In future, AI systems will become more intrusive and pervasive in our everyday life. Records of all our movements, our health, and our financial transactions will be in the cloud, managed by a, multinatural, a multinational quasi-monopoly. The data may be used for benign reasons, for instance, for medical research, or to warn us of incipient health risks, but its availability to internet companies is already shifting the balance of power from governments to globe-spanning conglomerates. That's one concern. Also, of course, the incipient shifts in the nature of work have been addressed in several excellent books by economists and social scientists. Clearly, machines will take over much of manufacturing and retail distribution. And they can supplement, if not replace, many white collar jobs, routine legal work, accountancy, computer coding, medical diagnostics, and even surgery. Many professionals may find their hard earned skills in less demand. In contrast, some skilled service sector jobs, plumbing and gardening, for instance, they require such non routine interactions with the external world that they'd be among the hardest jobs to automate. The digital revolution will generate huge wealth for innovators and global companies. But preserving a healthy society will surely require redistribution of that wealth. Indeed, progressive politicians in Europe argue that to create a humane society, governments will need to tax them heavily and use the money raised to vastly enhance the number and status of jobs for those who care for the old, the young and the sick. There are currently, in most countries, far too few such jobs and they're poorly paid, inadequately esteemed, and insecure. These jobs, though, are far more fulfilling than working in a telephone call center or an Amazon warehouse. So if those latter jobs can be replaced by jobs where being human makes a difference, that is a win-win situation. But it requires tax and massive redistribution. But let's now look further ahead. How human will these machines be? And will these machines ever, as some science fiction stories imagine, develop a mind of its own? If, if a machine did, would it stay docile or would it go rogue? Popular culture portrays a dark side where AI gets out of its box, infiltrates the internet of things and pursues goals misaligned with human interests or even treat humans as an encumbrance. Some AI pundits take this seriously, and they think 
that this field already needs guidelines, just as biotech does. But others, like for instance Rodney Brooks, inventor of the Baxter robot and the Roomba vacuum cleaner, he regards these concerns as premature. He thinks it'll be a long time before artificial intelligence need worry us more than real stupidity. But be that as it may, it's likely that society will be transformed by autonomous robots, even though the jury's out on whether they'll be idiot savants or display superhuman capabilities. This is the futurologist Ray Wood Kurzweil, who now works at Google. He argues that once machines had surpassed human capabilities, they could themselves design and assemble a new generation of even more powerful ones. An intelligence explosion, what he calls a singularity. He wrote a book called The Age of Spiritual Machines, where he predicted that humans would transcend biology by merging with computers. But Kurzweil is worried that this nirvana may not happen in his lifetime. He's in his 60s already. So he wants his body frozen until it's reached. There's a company in Arizona that will freeze and store your body so that when immortality is on offer, you can be resurrected or your brain downloaded. And in fact, I know three of my colleagues who've paid for this to happen when they die, two uh, full whack, a third the cut price for just having his head frozen. I'm glad to say they were all from Oxford, not from my university. And I tell them I'd rather end my days in an English churchyard than an American refrigerator. But of course, more seriously, research on aging is being prioritized. But will the benefits be incremental or is aging a disease that can be cured? Dramatic life extension would be a real wild card in population projections with huge social ramifications. But it may happen along with many other human enhancements in other forms. And it's at least surely on the cards that human beings, their mentality and their physique may become malleable through the deployment of genetic modification and cyborg technologies. Moreover, this future evolution, a kind of secular intelligent design, will take only centuries, in contrast to the thousands of centuries needed for Darwinian evolution. And this is a game changer. When we admire the literature, artifacts, or theological ideas that have survived from antiquity, we feel an affinity across the gulf of thousands of years with those ancient artists and philosophers and their civilizations. But we can have zero confidence that the dominant intelligences a few centuries hence will have any emotional resonance with us, even though they may have some kind of algorithmic understanding of how we behave. Let me now turn to my favorite technology, space. This is one where technology has huge benefits. It's beyond our earth in environments hostile to humans that cyborg and AI technologies have the most spectacular scope and where these changes will happen fastest and should worry us least. During this century, the whole solar system will be explored by swarms of miniaturized probes far more advanced than, for instance, the wonderful Cassini probe designed in the 1990s, which spent 13 years exploring Saturn and its moons, or the robot that the European Space Agency landed on a comet, Rosetta, or the NASA probe that transmitted amazing pictures from Pluto, more than 10,000 times further away than the moon. Think back to the computers and phones of the 1990s when these probes were designed and started their 10 year or more journey and realize how much better we can do today. So we can expect swarms of probes exploring the solar system and also deployment in space of robotic fabricators 
is to build large structures, for instance, giant telescopes with huge gossamer thin mirrors assembled under zero gravity. So the scope for industry in space. But what about manned space flight? Here I'd argue that the practical case gets ever weaker with each advance in robot and miniaturization. So will it have a resurgence? It's over 50 years since Neil Armstrong's one small step on the moon. And I cherish this photo signed for me a few years ago by seven of the Apollo astronauts. In the 1960s, there was a space race between the Americans and the Russians. And NASA got about 4% of the federal budget. Had the pace continued, there would have been footprints on Mars long before today. But once the Americans had won the space race, there was no motivation for considering for continuing that uh, huge expenditure, which is now about 0.6%, not 4% of the federal budget. But hundreds of people have, of course, ventured into space in the last 50 years, but uh, anticlimactically, most of them have done no more than circle the Earth in low orbit, mainly in the International Space Station. They only make news when something goes wrong, when the loo fails, for instance, or when they perform stunts like the Canadian Chris Hatfield playing his guitar and singing David Bowie songs. So will there be any inspirational Apollo style man projects? There's no denying that NASA's Curiosity probe, which is now trundling across a Martian crater, may miss startling discoveries which no human geologist could overlook. But machine learning is advancing fast, as is sensor technology. In contrast, the cost gap between manned and unmanned space missions remains huge. So the case for sending humans is getting weaker. And incidentally, there are three missions to Mars going to be launched in the next uh, 20 years. So in the next 20 months. I think the future of manned space flight lies with privately funded adventurers prepared to participate in a cut price program far riskier than Western nations could impose on publicly supported civilians. Elon Musk's SpaceX and Jeff Bezos' Blue Origin will soon offer orbital flights to paying customers. And were I an American, I would only support NASA's unmanned program. I'd argue that private enterprise ventures, bringing a Silicon Valley culture into a domain long dominated by NASA and a few aerospace conglomerates, should front all manned missions and do this as cut price, high risk ventures. The problem with NASA is it's got to be risk averse because it's using taxpayers' money to expose civilians to risk. But even if the risks are high, there'd still be many volunteers. Some perhaps even accepting one-way tickets, driven by the same motives as early explorers, mountaineers and the like. And by 2100, some courageous thrill seekers may have established bases independent of the Earth, on Mars or maybe on asteroids. And Elon Musk himself, now aged 49, says he wants to die on Mars, but not on impact. But don't ever expect mass emigration from the Earth. Nowhere in our solar system offers an environment even as clement as the Antarctic. And here I disagree with Musk and with my late colleague Stephen Hawking. I think it's a dangerous delusion to think that space offers an escape from Earth's problems. Dealing with climate change on Earth is very simple compared to terraforming Mars. There's no planet B for ordinary risk averse people. Nonetheless, we should cheer on these brave space adventurers because they'll have a pivotal role in spearheading the post-human future and determining what happens in the 22nd century and far beyond. This is why they'll be ill-adapted to their Martian habitat. So they'll have a more compelling incentive than those of us on Earth to redesign themselves. They'll harness a super powerful genetic and cyborg technologies that will be developed in coming decades. 
these techniques will, one hopes, be restrained here on earth on grounds of prudence and ethics. But the settlers on Mars, they'll be beyond the clutches of the regulators. And we should surely wish them good luck in modifying their progeny to adapt to this hostile environment. So it's these spacefaring adventurers, not those of us comfortably adapted to life on Earth, who will spearhead the post-human era. Maybe they'll eventually download themselves into something that's electronic and not flesh and blood. That would be an epochal transition, because they then wouldn't need an atmosphere. They might prefer zero G. Then they wouldn't need to stay on the planet. And if they're near immortal, they wouldn't be daunted by an interstellar voyage lasting millennia. And they could go around to the stars. Now, these thoughts raise the question which astronomers like me are most often asked. Is there life out there already? Or is the galaxy waiting for our remote post-human progeny? Well, there may be some freeze-dried bacteria on Mars, the red planet. There may be some creatures swimming under the ice on Saturn's moon Enceladus. But there's no advanced life elsewhere in our solar system. But let's widen our horizon to the realm of the stars. One exciting thing we've learned is that most stars in the sky are orbited by retinues of planets, just like the sun is. The evidence though is mainly indirect. It's very hard to see the planets, but we can detect its influence on the motion or brightness of the star it's orbiting. For instance, one very simple technique is shown here. If a planet transits across the face of a star, it blocks out a bit of the star's light. And by monitoring those dips, then you can detect how big the planet is compared to the star, and by monitoring the interval between them, what the planet year is. By this method, a spacecraft called Kepler observed 100,000 stars and found thousands of planetary systems. And uh, let me show this rather silly uh, cartoon, uh, which uh, scales them, but, but each of these si systems denotes uh, um, a star with planets around it of known mass and known length of year. The special interest in possible twins of the Earth, planets the same size as ours, with orbits such that the temperature allows liquid water to exist. This is a so-called habitable zone of planets. Many of these have been found. There are thought to be millions in the Milky Way. And roughly speaking, we can say that almost every star has a planet around it. And about one in every six stars has an Earth-sized planet, which is potentially habitable. And indeed, there's one such star, one such planet orbiting the nearest star, Proxima Centauri. And there's another faint star about 40 light years away, which is about 1% as bright as the sun. And it's a miniature solar system. It's got seven planets orbiting around it, all about the size of the Earth. And the year for the innermost one is one and a half of our days. And for the outermost one, it's about two weeks. So this is a miniature solar system. We don't know what it'd be like to live on there, but all these are potential abodes for life. Well, we can't yet, as I said, detect these planets. They're too faint. It's like looking for a firefly next to a searchlight. The uh, star is so much brighter. But within about 10 years, we'll have telescopes. In particular, we'll have this European telescope. It's got an unimaginative name. It's called the Extremely Large Telescope. It's been built in Chile, and it will have a mirror a mosaic mirror 39 meters across. And this will collect enough light to be able to collect light from a planet orbiting another star and to analyze the spectrum of that light to see is it especially green, does it have water, does it have oxygen, etc. And perhaps test whether these planets have a biosphere of some kind. But as I say, we don't know what that likelihood is because habitable doesn't mean inhabited. We know too little, incidentally, about how life began on Earth. 
You don't know whether it was a rare fluke or whether it would happen elsewhere. But it's one of the most important questions to find evidence for a biosphere elsewhere. Because even more exciting is evidence for intelligent life, so-called SETI. I think the chances of that are even smaller, but nonetheless, I'm glad that different private foundations that are funding searches for evidence of something that's manifestly artificial out there. We don't yet know. Although I have to say that I get letters from people who uh, say they've met the aliens, they've been abducted by them, etc. And I express skepticism and tell these people to write to each other and not write to me. Well, I want to move on now because that's a topic for a different lecture and I'm almost out of time. Uh, but let me just uh, um, emphasize some special perspective which astronomers bring, I think, to these issues. Most educated people are aware that we are the outcome of uh, four billion years of Darwinian evolution and that the Earth is about four and a half billion years old. But all too many somehow think that we humans are the culmination of this. No astronomer could believe this because we know as astronomers that the Earth is less, is less than halfway through its life. The Sun has enough fuel to go on for another six billion years and the expanding universe may go on forever. And to quote Woody Allen, eternity is very long, especially towards the end. So, we may ourselves be nearer the beginning than the end of evolution. And that therefore means that even if life is now unique to the Earth, it need not remain a trivial feature of the cosmos, because humans could jumpstart a diaspora whereby ever more complex intelligence spreads through the whole galaxy. There's plenty of time for that. So we are still near the beginning and the end. But let me finish by zooming in from the universe to the realities of the here and now. And to point out that even in the context of this concertina timescale on the slide, stretching billions of years into the past, but billions of years into the future as well, this century is special. The Earth's been around for 45 million centuries already, but this is the first when one species, ours, has the planet's future in its hands. And our creative intelligence could jumpstart the transitions from an Earth-based to a space-based species and from biological to artificial intelligence. And those transitions could inaugurate billions of years of post-human evolution, even more marvelous than what's led to us. On the other hand, humans could trigger bio, cyber, or environmental catastrophes that foreclose all such potentialities. So my message is that this Earth, this pale blue dot in the cosmos, is a special place. It may be the unique place where it's stewards at a specially crucial era. And that's an important message for us all, whether we are astronomers or not. So thank you very much for listening.